Good morning. Welcome to worship at Asbury. My name is Maggie Dunaway, and I'm honored to be one of the pastors here. It is so good to see each of you. I'm nursing a little bit of a cold, so I'm going to hang on to this water <clears throat> and sound like a frog, but I know y'all are going to forgive me, and I'm probably not the only one. Here in our service, we want to give Jesus our best each and every Sunday. Just you being here today says that you are ready to give your best, ready to worship, ready to praise, ready to pray. We have another opportunity for you to grow a little bit deeper in your faith. We have a worship night coming up, and it is not tonight, but next Sunday at 6 p.m., and we have child care available for that. I think um, littles through second grade, I believe, or no, through four years old. We have child care available if you need that. But what is worship night? It's a night that's set apart, a more intentional moment for you to pray, for you to sing, for you to think about things that, um, that glorify God. There won't be a big sermon. It's really just about praising and worshiping our risen Savior. So I invite you to that. If you haven't experienced a worship night before, we did one um, this past fall. It was phenomenal, very deep, very moving, and just a way for you to inch closer to God, to be in conversation with God a little deeper. At the beginning of each one of our worship services, we open in prayer, followed by the Lord's Prayer. I invite you now to stretch out your hands to be in a position that's ready to hear what God has to say to you today, what you have to say to God today. Let's pray together. God, would you open our hearts this morning? Can you help us to listen closely to the words of encouragement that you offer us? Let each person here internalize those words. God, help them to become the very fiber of our being and frame our thoughts and actions with your love. We lift so many people in our prayers this morning. Let's take just a moment, just a moment of quiet, God, those words will surface up. They'll come to our minds, those names, those situations, those, those points of stress that we just can't seem to let go of. God, let each one drift up and let us turn them over to you. Father, you have placed us in this global community. This community in which illness, oppression, <coughs> fear, and anger abound. God, you ask us to proclaim your words of hope and love, of healing mercy for all your people. But God, we turn our backs on people in need. We seek our own comfort and neglect opportunities to help others. When we, by our thoughts and actions, or maybe even by our inaction, betray you. God, I know the suffering. You told your people in Egypt I have observed the misery of my people. 
I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. God, forgive us for all those acts of cowardice and self-centeredness that draw us away from you. Enable us to be those people who will work for peace and hope for all your people. Strengthen us to truly be your witnesses this day and all our days. God, we ask these things in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand now and let's make a joyful sound unto God.
use his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake Well, you really are um, so happy that you're here today, and you may be seated. Um, we're so happy you're here, and we want to know it. So if you don't mind, there's an attendance little notebook at the end of each of your pews, 
If you'll take a moment and fill that out, and there's a QR code if you'd rather use your phone to do that, or you can use pad and pencil. There's a couple of other things in there. If this is your first time visiting with us today, would you do us a favor and fill out this blue card and take it to the Welcome Center after worship, and we've got a gift for you, and we just love an opportunity to get to know you and what brings you to our church family. If it is your first time and maybe you're interested in what does it look like to be a part of this family, this Asbury family, we have an event going on today after worship. It's called Asbury Engage. We talk a little bit about the history of the United Methodist Church, a little bit about how this church on 119 and 280 came into being, and just a little bit more about what it means to worship, grow, and serve here as part of our family. We'd love to have you come. Lunch is provided. We've got child care. Um, just show up. It's downstairs in Wesley Hall, and one of our hosts will be happy to show you where that is. The last card I just want to highlight is the prayer request card. Uh, we consider it an honor and a privilege to enter into prayer with you about those things that are on your heart and mind that you might have lifted up today. Be sure to fill out one of those if there's something that you want your pastoral team to pray about or even our prayer ministry. If you want to be on the prayer team, I don't say this often enough, all you have to do is shoot me an email and let me know. And you'll start receiving a weekly email with all our Asbury family and friends prayer concerns. And all you have to do to be on that team is to pray, is to read that list, to look over it, to lift up those names to God in covenant prayer. I want to ask Pat Connor now to come up and she's going to read our scripture today. Our scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. In everything, do to others as, as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. Our hearts and minds are open. Amen. Here in the modern ch service, children are always welcome for the entire service. Our kids' ministry does offer a children's church for K through second graders. My name is Pat, and if you would like to be a part of that ministry, you can meet me in the back of the room, and I will walk with you to room 214. My name is Michael Bowman, and as Maggie said earlier, behalf on the pastoral team at, here at Asbury, it really is good to be with you all today in worship. Um, I want to start with a TV show that Grady started watching when he was probably around two, maybe three. Sarah will correct me after this, but um, two or three, Grady started watching this show. It felt pretty underground to me. Uh, you probably never heard of it. It's called Sesame Street. Oh, so you guys have heard of the show. Uh, yeah, Sesame Street, um, which was a very welcome reprieve to the endless amount of baby bums and nursery rhymes and lullabies that were constant in our house at that time. Um, Sesame, Street is, Sesame Street is great. I didn't really grow up watching the show myself, so getting to watch it as an adult was super fun. There is a segment on the show called The Word on the Street. The Word on the Street. And in one particular episode, the word on the street was the word respect. 
So Murray, who's this character with red and orange crazy hair that's floating all over the place, goes out onto the street and he starts asking people, what does the word on the street mean? So in this episode, he goes up, very first clip, there's a little girl standing there, probably no older than six or seven, and Murray comes up to her and says, what does the word respect mean? And without missing a beat, she looks at him and says, respect means treating other people the way you want to be treated which sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? A bit similar to Jesus's words that Pat read for us a moment ago. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. The text this morning comes kind of towards the end of what is known uh, for Jesus. It's, it's known as his Sermon on the Mount. It's found in Matthew chapter seven, right there towards the end of his teachings. You can find the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters five, six, and seven. And if you are unfamiliar with what this is, the Sermon on the Mount, I think it would suffice to say, is Jesus' manifesto for what it means to be human. And even more than that, it's his manifesto for what it, or how we are to be human in this world now. As you read through the Sermon on the Mount, then you quickly notice that most of what Jesus is talking about, at least right there in the core of all of his teachings, has to do with how we relate to one another all the while are all in the midst revealing the kind of relationship that we already have with God. So Jesus is sharing with his followers the way we are uh, to live in relationship with others, all the while revealing the relationship that we already have with God. And he talks about things uh, like the people who are particularly blessed, the kinds of people who are really blessed. That's how he starts it all out. Then he starts talking about how we are to relate to this world around us. He gets into things like anger and divorce and adultery. He talks about being people of integrity. He hits on revenge and this really difficult concept of loving our enemies. He talks about giving to those in need and judging others amidst teachings on how we are to pray, how we are to fast, and why we should be a people who never, ever worry. As Jesus goes about his teachings, he starts bringing up scripture. Uh, if you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, then you know that he talks about, uh, he pulls from Leviticus, he pulls specifically from the Ten Commandments, and he does this really interesting thing with the scriptures. He doesn't just bring it up to like back up his point. He actually starts saying things like, you've heard it said, and then he quotes a Ten Commandment. But he doesn't stop there. He actually continues and said, but I say to you, and he adds his own teaching on the matter. And all of this is geared towards Jesus' announcement that he had said previously that there is this new kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the heavens is now here and it is available and accessible to you and me even right now. And in light of this kingdom, Jesus is inviting his would-be followers to change their way of seeing this world, to change their way of even being in this world. And he closes all of this core teaching out by saying... Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, if your Bible is open or you know about the Sermon on the Mount, that's actually not the last thing Jesus says. In fact, he continues in chapter seven. Matthew records him talking about things like, oh, I don't know, uh, building your house on a rock instead of building your house on the sand. That's really the last thing he says. But the core of his teaching he closes out with this line, do to others as you would have them do to you. But he even adds a little bit more, at least according to Matthew's text. He says, for this is the law and the prophets, which leads me to believe that Sesame Street and Jesus really do have a lot to teach us. I didn't know I was gonna rhyme. Um, It just kind of came out that way. But Sesame Street and Jesus really do have a lot to teach us. Now, this golden rule as we have named it today was not original to Jesus. In fact, there are multiple different variations of this teaching, uh, different authors, in fact, different faith traditions, Jewish, non-Jewish, etc. For example, there's this old story about a rabbi named Hillel, who historically speaking is known as Hillel the Great or Hillel the Elder who uh, lived during the time of Jesus in Jerusalem and was a very influential rabbi. Jesus probably sat under some of his teaching, especially when when he was in Jerusalem for things like the Passover or for his bar mitzvah, for example. Uh, But there was also another rabbi during that time named Shammai. Uh, Now Shammai and Hillel 
um, had two different uh, teachings in regards to the scriptures. Hillel was known to have a more looser interpretation of the scriptures, of the text. Whereas Shammai was known for having a more legalistic and strict uh, interpretation of the text, of the Hebrew scriptures. So the story goes like this. There is a Gentile man who was in Jerusalem and he comes to Shammai first. And he says to Shammai, look, I'm not gonna be here very long, but I, I wanna be a convert. I want to become Jewish myself, for lack of a better term. And he comes to Shammai and he says, can you teach me the whole of the Torah? Listen, I'm not gonna be in Jerusalem very long. Like I'm about to leave. Can you teach me the whole of the Torah while I stand upon one foot? To which Shammai responds angrily and chases the man away from his presence. In fact, some renderings of the story say that he grabbed a reed and tried to hit him with it. Um, so the man goes to Hillel instead. He says the same thing. I want to become Jewish. I want, I, want to, I want to become a convert, but I'm not going to be in Jerusalem very long. Can you teach me the whole of the Torah while I'm standing on one foot? To which Hillel welcomes the man in and he says to him, whatever is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. I mean, imagine this scene. He's standing there. Whatever is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. This is the whole of the Torah. And then he says this beautiful line. I need some balance. He says this beautiful line. All the rest is commentary. Now go and study, that is, now go and live this out. Do not do what is hateful to your fellow man. This is all the Torah. All the rest is commentary. Now, Jesus may have actually come across this teaching of Hillel. We don't know. He might have sat under this teaching. He might have heard the story. But isn't it interesting? Um, Hannah, can you throw that back up one more time? Whatever is hateful to you, do not do. This is in the negative. But when it's attributed to Jesus, he says, do to others. It's attributed to Jesus in the positive. It was as if, Jesus is giving some of his best teachings and he's looking out over his followers or his would-be followers, his apprentices, and he's saying to them, I know I spent a lot of time talking about this specific stuff, getting into it, all that, but really all I am saying to you is this. Everything that I've said to you can be summed up in this way. Do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, what is the law and the prophets? What does he mean by this is the law and the prophets? Well, the law and the prophets are all of the Hebrew scriptures, the law being the Torah, or as we know, the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is all of that. And then the prophets would be like everything else. All of the scriptures, Jesus is saying, all of the scriptures and everything that I've just taught you can be summed up in this way, do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, I think Hillel would be in agreement with Jesus because remember, he sums it up pretty much the same way. And he says, everything else, everything else is commentary. Everything else is trying to say the same thing. Now, I wanna say this backwards uh, to make sure that we understand something here. And this is not a jab at anyone's intellect, but I'm gonna say it slowly I am pretty certain we are all tracking, but I want to make sure, even though this might feel redundant, I want to make sure that we see something here. This is the law and the prophets, Jesus says. What is the law and the prophets? It is doing to others as you would have them do to you. What's the first word in that command? You can say it, it's not rhetorical. Do. Do. This is a command word. This word has movement to it. It is a verb. It's not some static thing that sits still. It's not a lofty idea or some thought to ponder over. This is an action that you and I are meant to actually follow through on. The initiative is ours, to quote our friend from Sesame Street. The initiative is ours to treat other people the way that we want to be treated. And all of this, in a sense, boils down to one word for us, and that's respect. Do we respect someone enough to take the initiative, to treat them well? 
Do we respect someone enough to intend their good? When I think about this word respect, often what comes to mind first is like a company value on their website. We value respect at our company. Or maybe when you're walking through a business hallway, you see a a poster or a banner hanging in their conference room about respect. Respect is also like that character quality of individuals who possess a recognition that other people or something or someone is of worth. It's this uh, verb that, that seeks to reveal the admiration that we possess for another. Respect, this is like the hardest thing for me not to joke about, but I have to slide in this joke here. Respect is all that Aretha Franklin wanted. You really didn't have to laugh at that, but all week, R-E-S-P-C-T. But what is respect? If you look up Merriam-Webster, they have a definition. If you Google the word respect, they'll give you a definition. I'm sure they're all fine and good, but I want to offer us a really simple definition today of the word respect. Respect is letting other people be. Letting other people be, that's it. Letting other people be. And for followers of Jesus, that means respect is a recognition that each and every person that we ever encounter is made in the image of God. And this God who made each and every one of us in God's image loved the world so much that he actually would become one of his creation. And the person of Jesus who would usher in and proclaim this new kingdom, the kingdom of the heavens. He would bear a cross revealing the way, you know how it says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world. What is that so there for? It's to reveal the way in which God loved this world by bearing a cross, dying, only to defeat death and resurrect three days later, walking out of the tomb and then ascending into heaven so that we could possess the spirit of God within us. The power that raised Jesus from the dead resides inside you and me that we might be a people who love God and love others in this world who not only possess the fruit of the spirit as character traits, but also allow for the fruit of the spirit to bud up in and around us in this world. I'm gonna stop my soapbox rant for just a second and say that respect matters. It matters. But I gotta confess to you that when I was told that I'm preaching on a word, and that word being respect, I wasn't super excited about that. I don't know if I've ever really preached on a word before. And I'm not really 100% sure why it made me so uncomfortable, but. I think, if I were to guess, I think it's because somewhere along the way I thought respect was a given. That it was just natural. We all possessed it. We all knew what it was about. So what was I going to say in a sermon for 20 minutes about respect? But then I realized that respect is not a given. It's not a given. If you're like me, you would much rather not respect someone because that would infringe upon you and what you're doing and your time. You would much rather not let another person be. You would much rather not do to other people as you would have them do to you because that takes initiative. See, in Luke's gospel, we see the golden rule, as we call it, popping up again in chapter six. Now, In Luke, they have, uh, he also lays out a series of teachings of Jesus and it's not called the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, in Luke, it's called the Sermon on the Plain. And in Luke's gospel, the golden rule has a totally different context. It is in this crux of Jesus's essential teachings that Luke thinks we need to hear, just like Matthew. However, it comes at a different place. I'll paraphrase for you Luke 27, or rather chapter six, verses 27 through 36. Essentially, he quotes Jesus saying, love your enemies, We all got that one. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who abuse you. And then he brings it all home at the end of that little paragraph there saying, do to others as you would have them do to you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Love your enemies, he says. 
Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. Are you catching on that this is not a given? To do, to do that, to follow through on Jesus' teaching, to put his words into action, requires that our, our minds and our hearts, they gotta be in a different place. In fact, I would argue that they gotta start taking on the shape and the form of Christ's own heart. The golden rule and the nature of respect are devoted to the good of another person's life. Respect is about letting another be who they are and intending their good. Respecting someone means wanting what is best for them, even those who do not respect you. Even those who are not, quote, worthy in your eyes of such respect. Now, there is a disclaimer that needs to be said here. It really does need to be said. I want you to know what I am saying and what I'm not saying. What I am saying is that respect does mean to let another person be. Even the people that we cannot stand. Even the people that we disagree with. Even the people that we do not get along with. Even those who vote differently than you or think differently than you. Yes, even them. Respect is letting another person be. However, I am not saying that respect means to allow harm to continue. You know what I mean? Like respect, I would never tell a spouse in an abusive relationship that respect means staying with them and continuing to be abused. I would not say to the daughter of an addict that respect means letting the addiction continue, bringing harm to others and to themselves. I was talking with our very own Laura Province, one of our fantastic youth pastors, and she brought up, you know, hey, this all sounds really good, but respect is also about us. Like, we can respect ourselves too. And she says, for example, if if you're gonna talk about things like not letting harm continue, respect also means respecting ourselves enough to get up and walk away from a harmful or abusive or just simply bad situation. It's about us too. Letting other people be does not mean that we let harm continue. Now, listen, I know that my simple definition is that. It is simple and it has gaping holes in it and we can poke holes in it all we want. But I hope it also gets my point across that letting another person be means respecting who they are. And it looks different depending on the customer culture you find yourself in. Again, Laura pointed this out to me. She pointed out that respect looks differently in different cultures. For example, showing respect could look like everybody waiting for everyone else to be seated and having food in front of them before eating. It could look like taking off your shoes before entering someone's home or taking off your shoes before entering someone else's place of worship. It could look like covering up tattoos or taking out piercings depending on the neighborhood or the community that you are stepping into. Respect also means, though, on the flip side of that, being okay with the individual who wears shorts and a t-shirt to your worship service at church, even though you prefer wearing a three-piece suit to worship. It goes both ways. It's letting another person be exactly who God created them to be. In fact, I would go deeper than that. Respect is inviting someone to be everything, everything that God created them to be. This is why respect matters, because respect creates space for people. It creates this environment where someone can feel accepted and safe to be who they are and to express themselves as they are. Respect forms trust and well-being. Uh, By the way, like I said, it's not a given, but respect can be learned. And the best way to learn respect is by engaging, actively engaging in it. That is by doing. Which brings us back to Jesus. Jesus didn't say, check it out, guys, I got this cool idea. Wouldn't it be great if we were just all good with each other? I mean, seriously, listen, listen. Wouldn't it be great if we did to other people what we would want done to us? I don't know, we can just talk about it later. No, he says, do this. Do this. If you want to know what all the scriptures are about, what every bit of my teachings have been about, Jesus says, do to others as you would have them do to you. Respecting others is the simple act of treating other people the way we want to be treated. Think about it. We all simply want to be ourselves. We want to be who we are. 
We wanna feel accepted and safe. Respecting others allows for this to happen because respecting others, if I had a whiteboard, I'd draw this out. Respecting others creates this cycle, this cycle of outdoing one another in good. And in fact, it rids us of the driving and maybe even gnawing need to be better than, to divide from, or to simply hurt another person. I've heard it said once, and I think it might have been somewhere along the time where Sarah and I were going through premarital counseling. Uh, that, that happened when I was in college, so it might have just been some campus ministry thing, but I heard it said once that women want love, women want to be loved, and men want to be respected. That is some of the biggest load of garbage I've ever heard in my life. In fact, I I want to use stronger language that I can't say in church. Women want to be loved and men want to be respected. I get the sentiment, but we all want both. I want to be loved too. Just as much as I want to be respected. And frankly speaking, respect isn't possible without love. Respect has its roots, finds its foundation in love. Love undergirds all of this anyway. It is only when we come to the end of ourselves in all humility that we are able to see someone for who they really are and love them, maybe even respect them for simply being themselves. For some reason, a six-year-old on Sesame Street understands respect more deeply than I do. When I, when I saw that clip, I thought to myself, what does she know that I don't? And then I wondered, I still wonder if as children, it is easier for us, if it's easier for us to see one another as people worthy of respect, of of great worth, of, of great value, worthy of our time and attention, and yes, even worthy of our respect. I'm gonna go ahead and invite the band up. And, um, I feel like I should probably say some things that are on my heart um, that have to do with respect. It's all, it's all together. But I want to tell you, as one of your pastors, you should know that I've been pretty conflicted this week. And this isn't scripted. <laughs> but I've been pretty conflicted because of um, the news about Tyre Nichols, or Tyree Nichols, excuse me from Memphis, this is my hometown. And uh, I feel like I'm struggling a little bit today to be here, to preach on a word. When I got up this morning, I was telling Sarah, hey, I almost scrapped my entire sermon yesterday because I don't know if it's worth it. And then earlier, I'm not gonna share anything that was said, but we were spending time in prayer with the worship team and the amount of things going on and the amount of weight that so many of us are carrying. You included, right? The, the, the parent or the spouse or the sibling, the child who is sick. And God, we want them to be healed. I've read the stats on mental health, mental illness, Guys, this isn't something that we can just sweep under the rug. We gotta talk about it, right? Even just simple stuff, like it's really busy at work lately and I haven't seen my family in a while. The fact that the pandemic isn't even really over, even though we like to act like it is. I don't know, it's just heavy. And and I wanna say to, to those of us who might be in a similar position as me, that it's okay to feel what you're feeling and that if you need to sit The band's gonna lead us in worship in a moment in a a form of response. And this is a wonderful chance where we can stand and sing, lift hands, pray, lift our voices to God. And I hope we can do that. But sometimes praise and worship looks like sitting and crying. (laughs) Saying, God, how much longer? How much more 
can we take? How many more times can I see that news headline? How much longer until they're healed? I have a friend in the hospital. When are they going to get out and are they going to be okay? So stand. I want to invite you. Stand and sing if you want. If that's your response, do that. Be honest. Respond to God with joy and thanksgiving and praise for where you are, what God has done in your life up to this point to bringing you to now. But if it's, if it's pain and hurt that's inside of you welling up within you, then please feel the freedom to sit and be honest with that too. If it's hugging a friend or a family member just because you need to be that close. If it's a friend, ask permission. <laughs> But if it's just simply sitting in silence and listening or watching, if it's taking advantage of these two kneelers on the side and getting some space, if it's kneeling where you are, if it's grabbing Maggie or myself or someone that you trust to talk to and to pray with, please don't let the moment pass. I would love nothing more than to pray with you, to listen to you, and to tell you me too. I'm struggling. I told Maggie before this, I didn't even want to preach this message today. And I think it's worth it. I hope, I hope it was okay. But as I think about respect, we're in a, Jeremiah even pointed out, we're in a real relationship series. We're talking about real, authentic relationships. Man, there's good in it. There's love and there's joy, but there's also a lot of pain. There's reality. So I wanted you to know where I'm at. That it's okay to not be okay. And that it's okay to respond exactly how you need to this morning. Forgive me for the soapbox. They're okay with it. Jeremiah said, go for it. It's fine. But the love of Jesus in me wants to be shared and you need to know that you are loved exactly for who you are and where you are. You're worthy of respect. I told you it all ties in. And so is each and every other person you come into contact with. I'm going to save my sending till after. But would you guys lead us in a time of response? Stand if you want to, sit if you want to, respond how you need to.
will fix my eyes on you I will build my life on you Sing this out I will build my life And I will build my life Upon your love It is a firm foundation And I will put my trust in you alone And I will not be shaken So receive this benediction. A uh, reminder before you do, engages downstairs. You can grab me or Maggie, follow us. Free lunch, really. I mean, if you didn't even sign up, free lunch. That's all I need to say. Um, so join us for that. Worship night on the 5th. Mark your calendars. But receive this benediction, would you? And if you would, this, this is just helpful for me. If you want to just, like we do with the Lord's Prayer, just open up like you are going to receive something. It might help some of us. You don't have to, but if you're comfortable. You are the people of God. So leave from this place without timidity or fear of the need to divide from or to hide from anyone else. You are already good enough. You are already loved. Love others in the same way. Go in peace. Amen.